Romans, Romans chapter 8. You'll find the verses of Scripture we'll be reading in a moment. Chapter 8 of Romans, and I'm going to start with verses 1 through 17 and read the following verses later in the sermon. And before we get to that point, we do have a question to ask you, a question of the month. Um, very central to the Bible. If you're, interesting, if you're interested in what the Bible teaches, the Bible uses the word justify, justify, justification throughout the New Testament. So it's a real important word. So if you're interested in what the Bible teaches, it needs to be one of those words I have an understanding of what it means. So the question is, what is justification? The answer is this, justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only, only, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Only his righteousness, not mixed with mine. No, not his good works, and my good works mixed together. No, Jesus is the foundation of my salvation that I'll go to heaven one day when I, we all get to heaven. I'm not mixing the two. It's only his righteousness and his righteousness alone. Now, where does the Holy Spirit play a part in all of this? That's what Romans 8 is going to be all about. So let us read. We're going to start with verses 1 through 17. We'll capture 18 and 20 through 27 later on in the message. So follow along as I read Romans chapter 8 in verses 1 through 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also glorified with him. That is the word of God for now. Let us pray. Teach us, almighty God, the meaning of these truths, that you have touched us in a powerful way through the spirit that is eternal, the spirit of you, Father, and your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you were to study what the church believes over the years, you would find out that sometimes the church gets a little bit imbalanced. They overreact sometimes. Case in point, in the 1920s, 
the Bible college movement, the Bible conference movement got started. And it was a good movement. The early fundamental truths. Um, however, their theology, if you understand what this means, they were Arminian. And so they didn't mention the Holy Spirit very often because everything had been done. Now it's up to mankind to respond. The Spirit is no longer necessary per se to do anything special in the hearts of people. So as that movement began to move along, and I attended a Bible college from that movement, and it was a good Bible college. But during that time, since the, the Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity, as we call it, since that was sort of minimized, we have another movement growing during the same time in America called the Pentecostal movement. Slowly gathering 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And in the 70s and 80s, it became very prominent. And they overemphasized the Spirit of God making it something that it really was not. Case in point, one speaker. Do you, do you see the gold dust coming down from the ceiling right now? Do you see it? Do, do you see it? Power of suggestion. Do you see it? That's the spirit of... No, that's not the spirit of God. Or how about this, for instance? You come forward, and I whack you in the forehead. You fall backwards... And that's called being slain in the spirit. First of all, I might want to hit some of you sometimes. Not all the time. That would not be the Holy Spirit working in me, though. That would be a different spirit. There is nothing in the Bible that says that that's a part of the Holy Spirit's ministry. Nothing that looks like that in the Holy Scripture. Again, an overemphasis. And, of course, in the 90s, we had, we had people barking in the spirit. We had people laughing in the Spirit. We had all these overextensions of what the Spirit really is all about when the New Testament is full of the third member of the Trinity working in us as people. Think about it this way. Jesus says, it's imperative that I go away because if I don't go away, I cannot send the helper to you, the paraclete, the Spirit. What is born of spirit is spirit, and therefore you must be born again, Jesus said. If this morning you find in your heart, in a place and time, that you now love the things you used to ignore, which is God in Christ, and now you hate those things which you used to love, which is sin, you've been born again. Your heart has been touched by the spirit of the almighty, eternal God. He's worked in you, a real work. Or maybe you've had this happen in your heart, where both you know the dread of God and yet the delight of God in Christ all at the same time, where Christ says the Spirit is going to come. He's going to convict the world of, of, of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. If that's a reality in your heart, God Almighty has touched you by His Spirit. Or maybe in your heart of hearts, this is true of you, as a, as a Christian, that you value Jesus Christ like someone who found a great treasure in a field and you are willing in a spiritual sense to sell everything just so you can buy that field and have that treasure, which is Christ. Because Jesus says when the Spirit comes, the Spirit is going to glorify me. So this morning, what is your treasure? What's the most precious thing in your heart? If it is Christ Jesus the Lord, the Christ of Scripture, dead, buried, crucified, risen again, the Holy Spirit's worked on your heart. God Almighty has done business with you. So we don't have to make up things about the Holy Spirit. There's plenty of spirit here. But it doesn't stop with our awareness of our salvation. Paul even goes further and says, Christian, the Spirit of God is still working on you. Let us start in verse 1 of chapter 8, kind of being part of the introduction here. The first word of uh, chapter 8 is therefore. Therefore, since the things I've told you are true, therefore this is true of you. Since you have peace with God, chapter, one verse, uh, chapter 5 verse 1, since you have peace with God through faith in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for you. Your guilt is over with. There's no literally doom for you. Since you have died with Christ, pictured in your baptism, and risen to new life with him, there is now no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. 
Since you have died to the law and you've been married to Christ Jesus by faith, therefore there is now presently this very moment, Christian, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, none for you. It's gone. We've talked about this verse before. Oh, stingy Jesus, he drank all the wrath, didn't leave me any. I kind of like that idea. He did it all. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. It's gone. Presently. But notice, only in Christ Jesus. There was a, a skeptic and a Christian working in the hay fields. And the skeptic asked the Christian one day, how do you know? How do you know that there's no doom for you, no condemnation left for you? How do you know you're forgiven? And the Christian had a bale of hay on his back. And he said, well, look at it this way. And he dropped the, the, the uh, bale of hay off his back, and he says, I didn't see that it fell off, but how do I know it's gone? And the skeptic said, well, I imagine the weight of it's now no longer on your shoulders. And the Christian said, yeah, that's right. I can't see that my sins are forgiven, but the weight of them is no longer on my heart because Christ has taken it away. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christian, how often do you find your heart condemning you? He's greater than your heart. He's greater. There now is no condemnation. Now Paul wants to prove that or support that. Now the first word in verse 2 is for. He's not playing golf. How many golfers are out there? Okay, this isn't, this isn't for, it's for. It's why is this true? Let's support it. And here's where he begins to talk about the very Spirit of God. From verses 2 all the way to 27, it's about the Spirit of God, His work in us. Our doctrine this morning is this. The Spirit will expose that there is no doom for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no guilt whatsoever. Now, first of all, the law of the Spirit. Look at verse 2. The Spirit has a law too. There's the law of the Spirit which brings life, and then there's the law that brings sin and death. The law that brings sin and death is the moral law summed up in the Ten Commandments. We tried to keep them, but we can't. We don't have the ability to. We try to love God with all our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, and we try to love our neighbors as ourselves, but it just doesn't work. Did anybody get impatient this week with somebody? No, of course not. Of course not. We're all perfect now, aren't we? No, we got, we got impatient with our kids, with our spouses, with our neighbors, with our co-workers, our, our people. And we just can't do it. We, we, we don't love our neighbors like God loved us. And so the law just brings sin and death. But there's the law of the Spirit, which brings life. The law is not bad, by the way. The law is good. But it takes a perfect person to make that law come alive. Jesus Christ the Lord. Go to a junkyard with me. I, I used to love junkyards when I was a kid. I still do, but I don't go very often. And you find an old car there. And you think, oh, I love this old car. Let's put some gas in the gas tank. And let's start it up and drive it away. So you put a couple of gallons in, and, gug, 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 and the, the gas goes in. And you, you sit in the front seat, which is kind of nasty right now. You turn the key, and what happens? Nothing. Nothing. Well, it's because the gas lines are all rotted. There's no battery. There's no, there's, no fuel, there's, no, there's no fuel filter. There's no fuel system. It's gone. There's corruption. It's corroded. It doesn't start. Nothing happens. Take that same gas, siphon it back out, put that same gas in a new car that knows no corruption, and what happens? It comes to life. That's the law. What the law could not do because of the weakness of our flesh, God does something. In the perfect person of Christ Jesus, he comes and the law comes alive for you and I. And he says in verse 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through our flesh, through the God did it, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Only in the likeness. As an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So that, verse 4, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. 
Now, you want to get technical? Let's get real technical. Oh, come on, we can do it, Amanda. Let's get technical. Here it goes. Amanda knows when I say that, it's going to be really, this is real simple. That the law might be fulfilled in us. It's a passive tense, meaning we don't do it. God's done it for us. It's something that he's done for you and I already. It's fulfilled in us. Our justified, our, his imputed righteousness to our account, it's done. It's, it's complete because Christ has come in the flesh. Our new Sunday school class, which is going to start in four weeks, how do I share Jesus with the lost world around us? One of the unique things about the Christian faith, let no one ever tell you, all religions are the same. If they say that to you, what you say back to them is this, well, how are they the same? Or, do you think that Buddhism is the same as Islam? How are they the same? And they'll kind of give you a blank look. They really don't know what they're talking about. One of the unique things about Christianity is incarnation. God becomes man in Christ Jesus so the law can come alive in his perfection because he had no weakness, no spiritual corruption. The law came alive so that that law is now fulfilled in my account. But who's that true of? Look at verse 4. It's very descriptive. That is only true of those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Oh. So my justified state is proven. It's shown. It's exposed by the Spirit as I live out a life that is not governed by simply the flesh. But I have a new compass. I have a heavenly compass. I have an eternal compass where he leads me in the way of everlasting. He restores my soul that I may walk in paths of righteousness for his namesake. That's what Psalm 23 tells me. So this is true of these kind of people. Now notice in verses 5 through 8, there's only two kinds of people. Those who walk according to the flesh, where the flesh governs their life, everything that they do, and those who walk according to the spirit, where there's always going to be a battle. There's only two people. There's not three kinds. Lewis Sperry Chafer, back in the 1920s, during this Bible college movement, tried to express there was three kinds of people. There was the natural man who's lost and doesn't really want God or Jesus. Then there's the spiritual man who's mature. And then there's the carnal Christian. There's no such thing as the carnal Christian. There's the honest, struggling Christian, which all of us are, trying to push forward, reach that mountaintop together. But there's no third category. There's either the person who's governed by the flesh or he's governed by the Spirit. And notice in those verses, verses 5 through 9, the word mind keeps coming up. What our thoughts are, what our, what our goals are, what our dreams are. What do we think about? Do we ever think about the things of eternity more so than when I pop into church every once in a while? Or does the Holy Spirit have a hold of my mind? Paul would say in chapter 12, by the renewing of our minds. So important that we don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, that we have a new, a new guide in my life. I no longer just call the shots on my own. God calls the shots. He calls the shots in the written Word of God. And I follow that moral compass now, which comes in the form of what we call the Bible. I let the Bible have, have, have sway in how I treat people, what I say about people, how I react to people. This governs my life. Let's say this. Let's say that you're in a field and there are, let's see, eight stages. And on each stage is something really wow. Your favorite music artist, your favorite bistro eatery, your favorite icon, um, your favorite movie, um, all down the line, all these things. And then on one of the stages is just little Jesus teaching. Which one do you choose? Honestly. Which one do you choose? I mean, because everybody's behind all the other big wow stages. Your favorite sports team, your favorite... The, and then there's a little Jesus with a few people around. Would you ever go there? Would that be your first choice? That's how you kind of know. Those who walk according to the Spirit or those who walk according to the flesh. Those who walk according to the Spirit, they are the ones who can say, there's no doom for me because I'm in Christ Jesus. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to be an honest struggler, pursuing, because last week Paul says, evil's all around me, but I still pursue. I don't make church sort of a temporary kind of maybe once a week, once a month sort of thing. I show up when I feel like it. No, you make God priority. Those are the ones who have their minds set upon the things 
of the Spirit. That is the law of the Spirit. Secondly, what about the leading of the Spirit? Well, look at verse 9. Look at the priority, how important the Spirit of God is to have in your life. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, Christian, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's an amazing thought. The Spirit of God, verse 9, dwells in me. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Hmm. That's a pretty potent thought, isn't it? Let's think this way. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden in our minds. Let's, let's put lifeless Adam on the table here. Um, God's formed the clay, and he looks just like Adam, but there's no life in him. And then God says, I'm going to breathe on Adam. And God breathes on Adam. And nothing happens. What would your conclusion be? That the breath didn't go into him. Right? Because if it really went into him, he'd come alive. I can claim to be a Christian. But if I don't show that I'm a Christian, then the breath really hasn't entered into me. The spirit really isn't part of me. And Paul says, that's priority. If I don't have the spirit of Christ, then I don't really belong to him. I can have it by calling upon his name, asking him, saying, Lord, please be my God, my Savior, my Lord. As best as I know how right now, I'm calling upon your name, God, because I know I need forgiveness. He'll hear you because he's full of mercy. He's great in mercy. There is mercy with him. And his greatness is unsearchable. He'll hear you, but you must respond to him. So that's the priority of the Spirit. What about the, the pressing of the Spirit? I like verse 12. Brethren, we're not under obligation to serve the flesh anymore. That's not who we are. That's not my master anymore. I don't have to say yes to him anymore. When, when Satan comes and throws rocks at my window, I don't have to go there anymore. I have a new master who I serve. And I'm constantly trying to put the old one to death. It would, be like a, it would be like a slave who had a real cruel, cruel master who would make him go out to the fields and even work when he was on death's doorstep sick-like, who would not feed him anything except feeding him from the trough of the animals left over food. He was cruel, but this master eventually became broke, and this man was now sold to another master who was gracious whose burden was light, who was kind and generous. And one day the old master came to the new place where the old slave was now under a new gracious master. And the old slave, or the old master said to the slave, Hey, do this for me. And he says, I'm not obligated to you anymore because I've got a new master and I'm serving a new Lord. And then the master comes along and says, Hey, he's not yours anymore. He's mine. Leave him alone. He's mine. I'm not obligated to serve the flesh anymore. I don't have to fall for those foolish lies, those empty things that people used to tell. I am a person who is now in Christ Jesus. And I'm constantly, verse 13, putting to death the deeds of the body. It's a present tense. Not too technical, right? It means it's always happening. I'm constantly, as a Christian, mortifying sin. I'm constantly having to put the fire out because it seems to be always with me, as Paul said in chapter 7, verse 21. I'm constantly mortifying my sin, trying to keep it dead. Kind of like a zombie movie. You know, a zombie movie? The zombie that doesn't die. You just can't kill it. You think you finally have got this thing, sin thing mastered as a Christian. You think, ah, oh, yes, I've arrived. And what happens? Oh, I thought that and you get tripped up at that sin that so easily entangles your feet, we're constantly putting it to death. That's, Paul says, that's part of the Christian life. I'm constantly always putting it to death. It's a present reality. But how do I do that? David would say this, Lord, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, I take your book your book of truth. I hide it in here so I will not fall for falsehoods. I'm done with that. Where do you hear the word of God? Hmm. Maybe in church? Maybe with the gathered saints? Maybe in Sunday school, ladies' ministry, men's Bible studies? Maybe you take advantage of those times to hide the word in your heart so you can constantly be putting sin to death. 
Because Paul says, that's what the Spirit is driving us toward. Because verse 14, for all those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These are the ones who do not know doom, who have no condemnation. Their sins are fully, fully forgiven. Led by the Spirit. Boy, that's been mis misused a bunch of times, hasn't it? Oh, my word. I'll give you a real obvious example of led by the Spirit being abused. Southern New Hampshire in the mid-1980s, a pastor said he was being led by the Spirit to leave his wife and to run off with the choir director. Um, is that being led by the Spirit? Uh, no, that's being led by something else. Being led by the Spirit is being led by the book and the people of the book. The church is a gift to you. The people of God are a gift. So when you have to make a decision about something, not only do you inquire from the book, but you inquire from the gift given to you, the people of the book. You ask them. You seek their counsel. The people have got to hear for you. Those are the people who are led by the Spirit. Those are truly the sons of God. I told you the Spirit's alive in our lives. He's not some dead third member of the Trinity. He's alive. We're being led by him by the truth. And then we have the spirit of adoption, where we cry out, Abba, Father, adopted into his family. In the couple, next month, I think, the catechism question is, what is adoption? Here's the answer. Adoption is an act by God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. All of them. We're received into the body of Christ. On the mission field, a missionary had, they had translated the whole of Scripture into the language of this certain tribe of people. In order to teach the Bible to them, they began to translate a catechism, believe it or not, into their native language. When one of the natives was translating the question and answer about what is adoption, when he came to the words that they have a right to all the privileges of all the sons of God, this is how he translated it. He said, that's too good. That's too wonderful of a thought. This is the right they have. They have the right to come now and to kiss his feet. That's how we thought that should be translated. Not that I have rights or demands, but I have the right to kiss Almighty God's feet in Christ Jesus. I think he's right. That's the, being led by the Spirit. We are being led and we have, we have the Spirit who, who gives us that spirit of adoption where we cry out, Abba, Father. That whole construction there, Abba, Father, a servant could not cry that out in their culture. But a child could. A son and daughter could. And we cry, Abba, Father, as people who are not the people of doom. We are those who are truly those who have no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. But not only that, we also have the Spirit in ourselves, verse 16, who witnesses with us that we are the children of God. A legal term. He testifies with our spirit. How does he do so? Well, it's not a secret whisper. It's not like he's walking up to us and saying, psst, psst, I think you're a Christian. That's not what he's doing. What the testimony of the Spirit is, he's leading us. The testimony is that we are being led by the Spirit. We see the value of Christ. We enjoy the ministry of the Word. We love the things of righteousness. We hunger and thirst for more. That's the leading of the Spirit. Not some secret whisper in the, the back of my head. And then he says these bad words for us in verse 17. If we indeed, we suffer with him. Oh, we were doing so well this morning, weren't we? But now he's calling us to suffer with him. But I don't want to, Pastor. I rebel against suffering. I say, do, I'm done. And Paul says, that's actually part of the journey with Jesus Christ the Lord. And that comes to our third point, verses 18 through 27, which I want to read because I want you to hear the words real carefully. Maybe this is where you feel like you are this morning. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that should be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we now... 
For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers with pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, which I mean the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope, does the, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but with the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He searches the heart's knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The fruit of the Spirit is hope and suffering. That I consider that the sufferings right now in this present age, they're temporary. Because when I go through suffering sometimes, Pastor, I don't feel like verse 1 is true of me. How could there be no condemnation for me? And look what my life is like. I'm going through all these difficult times. i got physical problems, relational problems, emotional things. I don't, this doesn't make sense, Paul says. The fact of suffering does not erase your justified state with God. Suffering is temporary. It's only during this age that it will take place. It will be gone soon. And by the way, suffering is the norm. Creation itself, it groans. Earthquakes, tsunamis. Creation itself groans. It knows futility because cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. And it groans. And it groans deeply. And we groan as well, don't we? We don't just groan because of suffering. The Christian groans because of the presence of sin and evil around him. The soul of righteous Lot was tormented because of the surroundings around him. He was burdened by it. David says, I cry rivers of water from my eyes because men don't keep your law. And we groan. Anybody groan this week? Ugh. Ugh. I can't do this anymore. This living thing is really hard. And this Christian thing, it's even harder. I can't do it. We, we groan deeply within. That's the Spirit working on you, my friend. We groan looking for our full adoption, the release of our bodies from this earth and state. You know, you go visiting. And uh, if you do go visiting a lot, sometimes it can be kind of depressing. Because you're going to nursing home, to nursing home, to nursing home, and all you're seeing is the, the end days of people. They've entered the winter of their days, and it can be kind of depressing after a while. You're constantly, constantly just giving and caring, and you're seeing things like, my goodness, I long to see the birth or the child pains of birth come to life. You see, when a woman is in labor, Andrea and Samantha, who's not here right now, but the, the, the pains are a sign that life is coming. Christian, the pains you're feeling are not the end, not the final thing. It's, it's a sign that life is going to be born, so don't let suffering dissuade you. For Paul says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can say the sufferings of this present time are not worthy for the glory that's going to be revealed in you. Isn't that amazing? Hope. And hope doesn't have a thing presently. Hope is waiting. The suffering ignites the idea of hope. I, I long for these things. And when I go to nursing homes and I visit constantly and see the suffering of people in hospitals, it doesn't tell me there's not a God. In my spirit it says, this is wrong and the right's coming. The new heavens and the new earth, they're on their way. I feel the birth pains of this world. And you do too. It's not a sign of death, it's a sign of life. That's the ministry of the Spirit. Those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no doom. And the last thing the Spirit does for us, He intercedes for us. And it says to us this, in verse 26, that He helps us in our weaknesses. Weaknesses. Notice plural. It's our weaknesses. We all have them. We're all broken vessels. We're all shattered by the world and the sin in the world. But He helps us in our weaknesses. Because when we go through trials, we don't know what to pray sometimes. How many here have come to a place in their life during their journey, 
maybe 10, 20 times, maybe just once, I don't know, where you found yourself just verbally exhausted before God. You had nothing else you could say. You were exhausted spiritually. You just didn't know what to say to him. You were like, Lord, I just, I, I got nothing, man. There's nothing in the tank anymore. I've got, no, I, I don't know what to say anymore. Well, here's what it says, that when I reach that point, like blessed Job, the Spirit himself groans within us. You can look at these verses two separate ways. You could say that the Spirit groans, he has his own separate prayer list, or that he groans through us, in us, as his people. John Calvin would say that Christ intercedes for us in the theater of heaven, but the Holy Spirit intercedes in the theater of our soul. We groan. Ever been before the face of God? and your prayers, and you just didn't have anything to say anymore, and you just kind of, you sighed. <sighs> I, I, I don't know what to say, God. That's the Spirit of God groaning. Hezekiah, look it up in your Bible, says this. He says these words, Like a crane and a swallow, so I chattered. I moaned or mourned like a dove. My eyes frail from looking up. I, I mourned like a dove before you, God, because my eyes were tired of looking up. How about Job? I go to the right, I go to the left, I go to the north, I go to the south. I can't find his face. Everywhere I look, I can't find him. And he groaned. He didn't know what to say. And even righteous Job, he struggled with his words because at the end of the book of Job, who is this who darkens counsel, who speaks words without knowledge? Sometimes we don't know what to say. And the Spirit in himself groans within our spirit before the Lord and he intercedes. I'll close with this last story. There was an elder in my former church named Earl Russell. He was dying. He was on his deathbed. I went to visit him in his home. Earl was a godly man who loved the Lord. And when I met with Earl, just to sit there and talk with him, I was the associate pastor, and the senior pastor was seeing him as well. I went to see Earl because he was a friend. His kids were in my youth ministries. He sat there, and I was, I was still young. I was only in my 20s still. And Earl, in his, in his last days, last weeks, this is what he said to me. He said, Steve, I don't want God to take this away from me. I just want to suffer well for his name. I just want to suffer well for his name. Walk according not to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Therefore, Earl, there is now presently, and there will never be, no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. Is that you this morning? It can be you. Just call to his name. He who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He who believes will have eternal life. That's what he's asking you to do, just to believe. The Holy Spirit in me. I don't need to make up these crazy things about the Spirit. The Spirit is alive in the heart of the Christian. Let's pray together.